Okay, folks. Hopefully y'all are having a good day. Welcome to WriteStream University, aka your writing and publishing course. Free six-week course, that's what I want to do. What I want to show you guys how to do through this process, we're on week three now, by the way, um, is how to write and publish a book. And so we're looking at a condensed book. I'm going to be writing a, about a 20,000 to 30,000 word book. Um, I've done a couple of those this year, kind of as an experiment. I'm gonna do another experimental one. I think when you're writing a short book, you can just kind of throw things at the wall and kind of see what sticks. Voices of the Void, which was the last one I put out. Uh, people tend, seem to really like this one, so um, that's kind of what our goal with our drafting process is, unless you have a different goal for like a larger book, um, is to get one of these smaller books in your hand, including paperback. So when we get to the publishing phase, that's going to include putting everything up on um, all the different platforms and positioning that book in a way that is going to be useful to you in some way. And I'll give you some options for that, uh, as well as being able to get a paperback going. I'll show you how to do all the formatting, um, how to start with, even if you have a pre-made cover, that's just the front, how to create like the back part of it uh, on a free program like Inkscape. We'll, we'll handle all of that. What we should be starting this week is what I call the drafting phase. So there's four phases. First phase is planning, and so we did that last week. And second phase is drafting, which is what most people think of as writing a book. That's the part where you're actually you know, typing the story into a word processor, or, or if you're particularly old school, writing it out longhand, and I'll talk about some things with that. Uh, right now I have planned to do two streams just on the drafting phase because that's that's where everybody gets hung up. It's where people feel like they're failures. Uh, usually you don't feel like a, you're, you're a total failure unless you're dropping the ball on this part of the phase or uh, you're trying to revise your work and you lose confidence. Uh, but I want to help you push through both of those potential problems and hopefully get a product out. Now if you want to write a longer product, obviously it's going to you know, just take the lessons and use them later uh, to put out whatever product you want to put out. Um, but for this, we're looking at that kind of a shorter, shorter product here. So uh, let me look at chat real quick and I'll answer any questions and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple things with drafting. First of all, strategies so you can actually get this project done. Um, and the second thing I kind of want to touch on is technique. I think beginners tend to be overly focused on technique and uh, people who've been doing it a long time would say that that's a dumb thing to say, but the truth is that like really good writing technique does not necessarily improve you know your your ability to sell books. Just look at things that are bestsellers. There aren't there's plenty of bestsellers that are not technically good. However, if your story elements are there and you have a completed manuscript and you have a completed book, that will position you for success and you will get there as far as your technical ability to write prose and dialogue through iteration. That is, you'll get there by actually repeating this process. So just uh, before I dig into uh, kind of a lecture on this stuff, um, imagine that you, you have two options. You know, one option is to do four years of like literature classes or even some some schools offer actual composition degrees, but you, you can do a four-year English degree or you can do what we're doing here five times, right? And if you're doing it six weeks, five times six, that's only 30 weeks worth of, of what we're doing. And maybe you're gonna take a year. Like if you're really on top of this and you don't have a lot of other stuff to do, you could put out five of these books in a year or you know in two years, so it's less time. Which of those two are you actually gonna, gonna get better from? Um, and I would challenge anyone to think that writing and publishing five books would not make them a better author than sitting in classes for four years. But here you are, you're sitting in a class. Keep in mind, this is a very condensed version of, um, of the things that I feel like people really need to know to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Um, we're not going to sit around and read uh, unpopular literature from a hundred years ago to try to figure out how that's going to improve us as an author. We're looking at the pulps and the things that people are doing to be popular and the things that you read now, and we're going to be trying to hit those styles pretty hard. And that's really what I want to focus on as far as the technique stuff goes. So let's take a look at the chat and then we'll get on to that kind of stuff. Um, forgot your pencil. Luckily, this is be this will be on YouTube permanently, so you don't really need to take notes, guys. 
<laughs> um, here's the thing that I used to tell students, you know, you take notes, I tell them you need to take notes, not because you're going to look at the notes, but the act of taking notes um, involves a mental process where you are transcribing the information and therefore memorizing it. So the act of taking notes makes you understand the information better because you have to recodify it into a note form. Um, you're transforming the information into another format that makes even better sense to you. So the act of taking notes actually makes you know information better than just listening to the information and certainly better than looking at somebody else's notes. Because if you look at somebody else's notes, you're looking at their transformation of the material, not your own. So the act of taking notes is very good, but you actually, you know, I, I took extremely detailed notes in every class at the university level, even at the high school level, and I just never really needed to look at the notes. I had everything memorized by the time a lecture was finished because of the way I took notes. So taking notes actually is a good idea for those of you that are engaged in any classes. Um, or if you just really want to remember a conversation you're having with someone, taking a lot of notes works. Uh, like if you go and you, I don't know, you want to take notes for a sermon, at church, you know, sometimes they give you like these outline notes where you like fill in the blank. I hate those. Flip it over to the blank page and create your own notes and you'll actually understand better what's going on there. Um, unfortunately, that will also reveal to you when somebody doesn't really know, that hasn't really prepared their lecture very well to begin with. Um, James Montoya says he loves the, th the, the thumbnail photo. I think I'm going to use that model for every single thumbnail photo. Um, for this entire course because she has like a million photos up. She's the girl from the from a meme, from one of the memes, where like the dude's like looking at a girl walking by and she's like, no, what are you doing? Um, that's her. So um, I just, looking for that meme and for like a different version of that meme, I, you know, I, she's on Adobe stock. So I just grabbed a photo of her because they're, it's such a, she has like such meme worthy expressions in all the stock photos. So I think I'm gonna use her for the whole thing. Um, and besides, there's also a marketing element there, which is, and we'll talk about this when we get to the publishing phase. Beauty sells. So if you're anywhere related to a genre where you can put a beautiful woman on the cover of your photo, you should think about doing that. Beauty sells. Um, now, I don't have beautiful women on the cover of all my cover of all my books, but I could actually redo them so that there was a pretty girl on the cover of all of them. And I bet it would improve their sales. So it's something I might do at some point. Let's try it a different cover that's like focused on females. So, so people think, oh, if you put a pretty girl on it, you're going to market to women. Not necessarily at all. Men will click on that too, because men are attracted to beauty and women appreciate beauty in uh, the female sex as well. Let's see here. Hoping that their host is well-dressed. I wear a black t-shirt most of the time. I think I'm just going to buy packs of black t-shirts that are just blank. That way I don't ever have to think about what I'm putting on in the morning. And my brother-in-law does that. He he only has black t-shirts. It's the only thing he owns. He only, like he owns a couple other shirts that aren't black t-shirts, but like every day he wears the same clothes, which is jeans and a black t-shirt. He's a contractor. Um, so he just never, there's no variety to his dress at all. He never has to think about it. Uh, all the shirts are the same size. All the pants are the same pants. So you just grab a pair of pants and grab your black t-shirt and you're good to go. Um, I feel like I'm on the set of a really moody western. Oh, that was the song. The song's called In the Wake. It's on David B. Stewart Zool, Memories Adrift. But you can get the physical or the digital version on Amazon. Both good. Let's see here. And there's, no, there's no vinyl version because there's not enough people who like that music for me to press vinyls. Or to even like care about doing a vinyl master. Because if I was going to do a vinyl master, I'd have to make it really good. Um, I just had a steak before the stream. Now, I noticed you spelled it S-T-A-K-E. Are you a vampire, Jared? Um, Blake Page Syndrome is my fatal flaw. I don't, I'm not sure what Blank Page Syndrome is, but if I were to guess, it would be seeing a blank page intimidates you. That's why we do the planning phase. So you're never looking at a blank page. You have a bunch of pages full of planning notes, and then you're just going to the next page and beginning the prose. Um, and that's an easy way to think about it. Um, another thing you can do to get rid of blank page syndrome is just write a page and know that you're going to throw it away. A lot of people throw away their first few thousand words they write. In fact, I did this on this book that I'm writing for this. So um, I wrote a couple thousand words and it got me to where I wanted to be as far as thinking of the initial scene and for the entire book and it made me change what I was doing. So I threw that away and I rewrote a new, uh, I wrote the first 2,500 words last night and like this morning. So. 
um, we're going to continue on with that. So I'm already 10% done, and that means that I can hammer this out in the next like 10 or 15 days, be done with the drafting phase, which is what all of you guys should think about doing. But you could take longer. So if you're already hopping into drafting, you'll be done um, hopefully by the time I talk about the revision phase. Spend a week on revision and then uh, spend a week getting all of your publication stuff together or longer depending on on how long it takes but i'll have all the information condensed so you could do you could potentially get the entire publication stuff done in a week uh, if you've never done it before i'm going to go like step by step by step and i'll probably make a permanent youtube series or youtube video for like how to publish your book for how to format it how to get a cover how to do everything uh, because i feel like there's there's just not a lot of clear information out there for that okay Hardwick Bento, I've come up with an ending for my book, but I'm having trouble with an early part of the story featuring a mutiny type situation. I might have to garden that. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, if, if it's hard to plan, kind of get in there and start writing the dialogue and see what happens, you know, F write a piece of dialogue. And then of course, you're going to feel how the characters are going to react to that dialogue and things can happen a little bit more organically. I never plot out dialogue. I plot out what's going to happen in a scene and then I just write it as I feel it. Um, and kind of through compose it on a scene by scene uh, basis. So that works for me. It'll probably work for you too. And if it doesn't, try it and then try something different. Try just writing the dialogue or try avoiding the dialogue and writing the action and that'll force you to have the dialogue that you want. Um, Dave's book is on Space Paladins. Yes, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but it's like Van Helsing or like... Yeah, it's like Van Helsing meets Warhammer 40k, but it's explicitly Christian. So it's like a, a, a vast future where there's still a wide, widespread church, but you're literally fighting demons. Uh, it's kind of interesting. So the first scene, so um, I talked about a three-act setup. I talked about a five-act in a separate video. So this is actually, I think I'm going to end up doing five-act for this. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I threw away my initial thing is I'm like, I wanted an initial scene that would serve just as exposition. So I have about a 2,500 word scene written and I'll, I'll put it out on my blog probably tonight or tomorrow, um, at least for a couple posts so people can, can view it. Um, but the point of the scene is that it introduces the main character. It, sh it shows him acting according to his job and it shows a really important moral conflict and moral element that is going to have an impact in the story later on. So it's mostly about character and setting exposition, but it's done through action. It's a very kind of spooky thing. Basically, he, um, you're kind of dropped. Rather than having a, an exposition, it starts with action. And it starts with uh, this character basically going down this spooky staircase at night. And then there's little future elements dropped until you realize like you're in some sort of future future element on a different world that's different from ours. Uh, and then he kills a demon and then he executes a heretic. And so that will show various points of his personality. He's basically, or you could think of it as like, it's like Judge Dredd in space. Christian Judge Dredd meets Van Helsing. Uh, in fact, that's probably how I'm gonna spin it. I think I was like 40, Warhammer 40K meets Van Helsing meets Judge Dredd, but I don't think it's like Judge Dredd meets Van Helsing, but Christian or maybe uh, Van Helsing meets Warhammer 40k meets The Exorcist. That's probably like what I'm thinking here. Uh, and I know they have those elements in Warhammer 40k, but it's going to be pretty different from that. Have you ever heard of William T uh, William Ten? I haven't. He was a 1950. Oh, you know what? I think I have, but I don't know if I've read anything by him. Um, he wrote in a satirical star, and his stories often had uh, wildly creative ideas. I don't know if I've read any William Ten. What is a paladin anyway? So I'm using paladin as a really broad term in a contemporary format. Historically, the paladins were the knights that served directly under Charlemagne. His 12 paladins, which were like his 12 apostles. I think there were 12. Anyway, so he had 12 paladins, which were like his 12 apostles. They were knights that uh, were basically warlords underneath Charlemagne. The most famous one was Roland, um, remembered in the, in the Madness of Roland. But they were, you know, regional regional warlords that um, were all Christians like Charlemagne and were dedicated to the faith. And so over time, that came to be a word that was associated with like holy knight. 
um, rather than saying Templar, because Templar, to me, Templar evokes the same idea as Paladin. So Templar, Paladin, but um, Templar historically is the Knights Templar, which is an order of knights originally called the Poor Knights of Solomon's Temple that were originally there to escort pilgrims to Jerusalem after the First Crusade and who eventually became one of these Teutonic orders that um, became very omnipresent in Europe. They became the bankers of a lot of nobility until they were basically killed by the King of France in a mock, uh, I don't know, like a witch hunt. Uh, and it's, I'm trying to remember the name of the last the last head of the Knights Templar, but he was burned at the stake and he cursed he cursed the king of France and the king of France like had horrible health and died after that like a few months later so it was like he invoked this curse from god and it killed the king of France for destroying the knights templar very interesting very interesting um, so i could have done that one um, i found out after starting this that john de la rose just put out a really similar concept like a uh, space templars uh, but his are more focused on Templars, like Crusade Templars. So this is a holy knight errant whose job is to uh, root out, basically be an exorcist, to root out demons and heretics and that sort of thing. So it's very supernatural. It's kind of like Voices of the Void. And Voices of the Void were space opera. So it's like the idea of horrible trans-dimensional demons, but instead of Lovecraft, it's just straight up space opera. And that's kind of what I want to experiment with this particular book. So if you like Voices of the Void, you'll probably like this one. There's a lot of darkness and gory, gory cool stuff that's going to be in this book. Um, but it's going to be very space opera. It's like this, but Star, like Voices of the Void, but Star Wars. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this makes sense, Film Girl says. Um, I have trouble making my writing flow smoothly and I fully and fully fledging out my ideas. Okay. So there's everybody composes in different ways. So if you have trouble fully fledging out the ideas, start by trying to finish your manuscript and get all the dialogue down. Then you can actually fix a lot of that in revision. So when you go to the revision phase, as you're reading through the prose, you can be like, you know, I need more details here. You can always add in sentences. In my experience, there's two kinds of revisers. There's people who cut and there's people who add. And then I guess, actually there's three types, which is me. I cut and I add. So I cut stuff that I feel like is superfluous and then I add things that I feel like are missing. So if, you, if you're if you rereading it after you've written it and you feel like there's missing details, you can just put those in. And I tend to, as I've finished each day worth of drafting, I go down and I usually have a separate document that's called revision notes and I'll write a note on something I wanna revise on a scene because I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to spend all my time revising the same scene before I finish the manuscript because I won't know exactly some of the stuff I might need to might need to put some extra details in there to kind of enhance uh, later revelations. Um, so I put a note, hey, you know, put more details. So like I wrote this, put more details about the books. You know, so there's a point where my character Jacobus goes into this house and I just left out all the details that were in it. It's not really a house because it's a, it's, I don't know how to describe it in quite quite simply, but it, imagine you know a a modular future house that's put in from space. You know, you bring it in on a spaceship, and then you have a mobile colony. That's what the house is. Uh, but uh, it's a place where occultists live. Um, but I didn't put in all the occult details, and so I just put that in there. Put in the occult details. Uh, put in more stuff on the books, and so I'll do that when I do a, re a revision. I'll add some stuff in. Regarding blank pages, I've worked as a small town journalist for about five years now, and I've never had a problem with writer's block. All thanks to good note taking. Good notes, write it for me. Yeah. So in journalism, it's it's mostly about communicating facts. If you're doing it, if you're being honest. Um, now I could wax poetic on what major journalists do now. Their job is actually to avoid writing the facts in a way that you understand what happened. The point of uh, a writer for the New York Times is to avoid being informative. And I've actually documented this on multiple cases, but the way that they compose the article is as such that they disrupt the flow of the narrative in a way that people construct a, a narrative that doesn't exist. Um, it's a, it's almost like wizardry, if you know, if you know what they're doing. Um, and you can look at some articles where instead of giving, say the, the order of events of a particular historical event, you know, this happened, this happened, this happened, which is what, an, 
a real journalist would do. Instead, they put the events out of order so that a reader doesn't know what happened. They explicitly do this. Or they interrupt the flow of those events by having, you know, Jerry Jerry Micklestone of Dayton, Ohio says this about it. And it's like, why, why are you having a random person's interview opinion in the middle of this article? But they do it all the time. In the New York Times, not on the opinion section, just in regular articles, even front page articles, they do crap like this. Um, the New York Times is absolutely a rag now as far as journalistic standards. It's pathetic, but most people are too... Um, they're they're not with it enough to see the compositional elements there. They're not skilled enough writers to know the wizardry that happens at these outlets. The New York Times is the worst. Washington Post is far, far slyer with what they do. And they're also tend to be a little bit more honest as a result because it's hard to be both sly and honest. And then, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal is the closest to honest, but also does this stuff. You know, there's no, there's no major outlet that actually just gives you the facts in in order uh, they just don't do it anymore because uh, that would mean people are informed and the point is not to inform them it's to make them feel the things you want them to feel and to have the opinions you want them to have uh, thoughts on hg wells's books i haven't read one in so long but i i was enjoyed the the i was enjoyed them um I don't think I'd have to reread some stuff to give like any kind of analysis. Should I write the dialogue in a scripting software before adding it to the main text? I wouldn't, but if that helps you, then do it. So if you want to write the dialogue in, say, Final Draft and then like copy paste it into a Word document, you can totally do that. It's up to you how you want to how you want to do it. I personally wouldn't, but if it makes you go faster to just ignore all the pros and just bang out the dialogue. Because with Final Draft, you can just press Enter and it'll just go through all the characters for you. It makes it really fast. So if that helps you with that kind of fast flow, then do it. Do what works for you. You don't have to do things the same same way everything else does. Rusty Heckler says it was a dark and stormy night. There you go. Run with it. Don't ever start a book with, with weather. That's actually when Elmore Leonard's like rules of writing. It's just a big cliche and it, a bunch of discerning readers will hate it. Start with something else. How does mine start? Jacobus could smell it in the abyss. It was unmistakable, sweet and arid like dry fruit, but beneath it, almost imperceptible, or perhaps only palpa uh, palpable by some aspect of the soul, was something that was far less alluring. It was a rotten sick odor, and Jacobus was intimately familiar with it. So we start with senses. Starting with senses is a great way to, to catch the reader. So this one I started with smell. Um, and then I say Lanchi stopped in, uh, on the stairs in front of Jacobus so I've introduced both characters in two sentences or three sentences and uh, started with something that's immediately like visceral a smell something less rotten odor and and a sweet odor and that odor represents what the demon is which is temptation and also like a disgustingness so the demon tempts you but the demon is rotten you know um, which is sin sin tempts you and then destroys you uh, and becomes disgusting you become disgusted with yourself have you seen the warhammer 40k fan film series astartes no i haven't uh, it was computer animated by one man and is visually incredible for such a small project. I'll check it out. I've only ever really played the games or like the tabletop kind of stuff. Um, actually, that was mostly Warhammer. But um, so like most of my knowledge of that comes from gameplay, not really like reading books about it. But I know it's it's uh, it's pretty huge. People like it. There's a lot to it. I really like a lot of the aspects of of um, Warhammer 40k. There tends to be most of the focus on the like the Imperium of Man which I think is super interesting, but there's, I don't know, there's so much room in a, in a universe like that. Um, you can really create some awesome stories in it. Um, Nitaku says, I may have spent too much of my planning on making a magic system. I feel I haven't fleshed out the protagonist enough. He still doesn't have a fatal flaw. That may reveal itself as you're writing. Don't don't stress it. Just start, just start writing and you'll it'll, you'll find it. You know, you really need to have the plot worked out. And the fatal flaw doesn't exist in the plot. You don't have to worry about it. Is your new story influenced by Solomon Cain? 
Yeah, <laughs> I could say so. Yeah, I think so. That's 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 pretty safe. Um, you know, thinking of somebody who who like fights evil, um, but more. Yeah, I, I I think Solomon Kane's a good one. Um, that's probably a good one to think about. Whereas maybe the last one was more Lovecraft, where it's like you're afraid of it. This is like you're fighting it. I uh, begin to write, and I already have written over 2,700 words. Good. Good job. Yeah, the exorcist is a, is an Ordo um, Malias Inquisitor. Yeah. Same idea, but Christian. Uh, have you read anything by uh, Manly Wade Wellman? I haven't. Um, what do you think's your best book? Depends on what kind of book you like. Just depends on what kind of book you want to read. So, um, this is never the response people like. People want to just have a simple explanation. But this is a much better way to sell a book. Just so you guys know, if someone ever asks you this, you say, "Well, you know, I have a bunch of books, and it just kind of depends what kind of book you are into." So, um, I'll give you three, three big ones. I'll give you four big ones actually. I don't usually talk about this one <laughs> that much. You guys, I lost my camera here. Um, this one's free on Amazon. I like it, but it's probably my least well-received book. Just it doesn't really get any attention, and I could talk about that maybe some other day. So I'm like, okay, do you like samurai? What do you like? I'm like, what do you like better, samurais or knights? And they're like, samurai. It's like, Psh, here's your book. It's the best samurai fiction book available, guys. Read it. Um, oh, I like. You know, do you like high fantasy? Well, what do you like in your high fantasy? Do you like, do you like The Hobbit better, or do you like something like Black Company? And if they say Black Company, I'm be like, here's your book, Neil Ash. Loved writing this book. It's very much like Black Company, but not about. Not as evil, you know. It's it's a great book. You know, and then of course if you like The Hobbit or you like really classic high fantasy, I don't know where my copy went. It's in the other room. Water of Awakening. Water of Awakening is what you should get. Um, and that one you can actually get for free. Uh, if you're on my mailing list, I think that one still goes out for free just because I want people to have it and get into the series. Um, so if you want to nab that one, usually you can get it for free. It's pretty good. Uh, I like it a lot. So every book I love, it's like a child. You know, you love all your children. It's like asking, who's your best, what's your best child? It's like, I love all my children. Depends on what you want from them. I have a child who's really good at this and a child who's really good at that. Um, Nitaku says, I start mine with the taste of the main character's blood in his mouth. Oh yeah, and then I could go, oh, but if you really like horror, you know, this is a good one. Do you like, if you like aliens, you know, this one's great. It's my best, this is my best aliens book. You know, it's my only one, but that doesn't matter. So it's better to sell people on their tastes rather than sell them on what you think is the best. Sell them on their tastes because if it matches their taste, they're going to like it more than if it doesn't, no matter how good the book is. Um, start mine with the taste of the main character's blood in his mouth after being punched. That's great. It's visceral taste. The, the taste of iron in the mouth, of blood, sickly sweet and bitter. You know, that's great. I like that. I think that's a great way to start. Do you think it's best to have the scene in your mind first before writing, kind of like a director, or should you go with the flow with what you write? Depends on you. So I have uh, I have a goal in mind for every scene, and I have where it begins, and I visualize it. I visually see it. I'm a very visual person as far as, you know, I have a really good ability to imagine spaces. So I imagine it and uh, I go from there and just kind of go with the flow from there. And so if the characters move to a different room, I have to imagine that and then write that, you know. So I don't I don't stop and imagine everything before I write always. I usually start with the first part and then kind of do everything else as I go for each scene. I know what I want to do in each scene though. I have like an idea of what plot event is going to happen. If I find that I'm struggling to make uh, my idea work, should I change it? Or is that just my self-doubt creeping in? I don't know. So I don't think you should change it unless you give it a really good effort. Uh, because this is not a terribly long book, it's pretty easy to get to the end of it. If it's very clear that it's not gonna work, you can always change it or tweak what you have. As you're writing down, you know, I don't I don't like this character that I've designed. You know, he's, he's too unlikable. Well, you, that, that's an opportunity for you to change him 
and to make it better without abandoning the idea. So usually you have to figure out what you think what you think isn't working about it. But self-doubt is a big part of it when you first start writing. And keep in mind the first time you try something, chances are you're not gonna be that good at it. It's just, it's, it's a natural thing. Know that if this is the first book you've ever written or the first long story you've written, you're gonna write better ones in the future. That's just how it is. It doesn't mean this one can't be good. Absolutely, it does not mean that. It just means it's going to be easier to to be better at it in the future. Trust me. You get better through doing it. Absolutely. Um, How long or how many words does a chapter usually need to have? This is a great question from Alpha Moore. uh, Alpha Mar. Um, So it, it doesn't matter. A chapter to me should be a complete area, story area. So the way you usually end a chapter is it ends as a transition to the next chapter, usually as as something final, like here's the end of this part of the story, or here's a cliffhanger, turn the page and read the next chapter. So it's just a way of sectioning off parts of the story for a reader. You could have no chapters and the story would be the same. The chapters are there to help the reader just feel like they're making progress through the story. Um, The chapter breaks are really not that important. Um, I'll show you a couple ways that I did mine. Um, So when I first started writing, I used to make my chapters about 10,000 words, which is too long. In my opinion, that's far too long to go through a book without seeing some kind of chapter heading. But it felt very substantial. It felt like that's a complete area of the story. So most of my chapters are between four to six or 7,000 words for me. So Muramasa has like 22 chapters, chapter 23. 23, you can't see it because it's too bright, but chapter 23. There's 23 chapters in this and there's 21 to 20 in my other books as well. So usually they're about 5,000 words average. Uh, but you can make it shorter. I know some people, every scene is a chapter. So where's Crown of Sight? So for Crown of Sight, if you guys get this one, um, basically it's a really short book, but it looks like there's 25 chapters. Each scene is its own chapter, and it didn't matter to me how long it was. There's scenes in here that are, are half a page long. You know, half a page, and that's all the information you need. So 500 words. 200 words. It just depends. I think um, for, for this one, because I didn't have a central viewpoint character, I was switching viewpoint characters all over the place and just marking it with scene transitions. Um, however long that scene needed to be. I wanted it to feel like a movie, and a lot of people picked up on that. Uh, they say that every story script idea you write um, have is like your child, and it's horrible if you have to kill your babies, so like throw an idea out the window. And it gets easier as you get older because you get you get better at the craft, you get less attached. Um, but yeah, you do have to, you gotta be realistic with that stuff. You know, it's like throwing out a baby. You're going to have some attachment to it. I'd like to see your reaction to the trailer for the lighthouse. It's a new movie with Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson that's shot in actual black and white film. Nice. Uh, they're making a, um, they're making a film version of the color out of space starring Nicolas Cage guys. It's happening. That's kind of fun. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons of immediately starting a book with dialogue yes so this was an email right it's it's great it's great to start a book with dialogue I think I've done it did I do it with Muramasa I'm not sure so dialogue is great because you're starting with the character you want to start with the character yes I started with dialogue chapter 1 Takumi's dinner what sort of man does this the floor is ruined the doors they shall have to be the innkeeper's side um there's a lot of communication in that dialogue it starts with dialogue like what is he talking about then i can then i describe you know what what's there you know it's the the head sitting on a bed of rice like this killer chopped this guy's head off while he was eating dinner this guy named takumi Uh, and so like that's it you know so yeah you could totally start with dialogue it's great what you don't want to start with is probably any kind of dry exposition about your setting. Never start with setting. Always start with a character doing something. Even Water of Awakening, which is very classic old-style romance fantasy. Um, I mean like 19th century romance, not like 
you know, modest ripping, right? Um, I start with the character. I'm just describing the character and describing her traits, right? And I could probably do that even better than I did it. Uh, and I could probably change it so it's more like Needle Ash. Needle Ash begins with like a, you know, slightly esoteric quote, and then you have uh, dialogue. It's an internal dialogue. It's a thought. This is a bad day to get by a battle, Michael thought. So it's great to start a book with dialogue because you're starting with the character. You're starting with something that immediately lets the reader know everything. Not everything, but immediately lets them know something about that character. Hopefully something that makes them interesting or likable. Definitely interesting comes takes precedent. You, can, you have about 5,000 words to hook the reader and most uh, where you can make somebody likable. But you, it's a really good idea to start with action. You know, you could do the in media rest thing that like Stephanie Meyer did for Twilight, which is like start with a scene at the end of the book and then backtrack. I don't recommend that always. You can do it. It works. But definitely starting with action is a good idea. And then you can kind of backfill anything that's needed for the exposition, like setting exposition. Don't start with setting. Don't be like, um, this was a kingdom on the coast of... And in this kingdom was a king, and their main trade exports were iron and uh, silver. The dwarves, you know, it's like, have you ever read these fantasy books that have these long, drawling expositions? Like, they read Tolkien, and they're like, what you got to do is start with exposition. It's like, Tolkien actually doesn't start with exposition. He starts with characters. I know that sounds crazy because like Tolkien's known for his books being a little slow to start, but they actually start with characters and the characters that you like. So even Tolkien knew that you don't start with just exposition. You got to do you do the exposition amidst the characters. I'm debating whether or not to title my chapters essentially planning a theme in the readers' minds or if it's preferable to just leave them in suspense. So, I've gone back and forth. I subtitle my chapters usually because I like it. It makes each chapter like its own story, and you can give some hints with that, just like you said. So I like to do it, uh, but you don't have to do it. There's nothing that says you have to do it. It's up to you to decide that. Um, Rusty says he was doing 10,000 word chapters when he wrote his first two books. Yeah. Uh, my story includes a startling a starting conflict between the protagonist and antagonist, but they're separated until the end. I have small scenes about with the antagonist, so he's still present. Suggestions? It's a good idea. Um, in Muramasa, because the antagonist is somewhat mysterious, I put in these little interludes between acts that were just focused on him doing something really bad to like just show how evil he was and remind you like he's the guy that we're trying to get. Um, but you know, as long as there's actions of the antagonist that are reverberating in the story, you don't have to have tons of scenes with the antagonist. But it's a good idea to have a couple little scenes where you can show him doing something. Um, you seem to suspect that the makers of Infinity War agree with Thanos' views, even if they disapprove of his methods. Do you think the same is true of Killmonger in Black Panther? No. No, I don't actually think so. I think that the makers of Black Panther uh, were trying to make Killmonger not necessarily sympathetic, but to, to justify why he has his ideas. And so on some level, they're, they're going to be familiar with those or maybe even see how that they're agreeable either to themselves or to other people. But I think the story doesn't show that they believe in those ideas because all of the characters are very re revolted by that idea. But what you do see is the protagonist react to that idea in a way it's like, okay, Killmonger is like this because we have not, you know, we have ignored our race beyond our borders. And so we need to do more to help the people of the world, not in conquest, but just, you know, we need to help. We need to help black people. And there's nothing like anti, you know, there's nothing uh, like black Hitler about that. Um, the whole point of Killmonger was to make him an intensely evil guy as a result of his situation. Um, and so it's a hard thing to say, like, well, you created a character who felt self-justified because of his bad situation. 
that's not a bad thing. It doesn't make you think the character is right. It just means that he is self-justified and the characters act and say things that go against that too. So I don't think that they, I don't think they hold that position that like black people should control the world or like black people should, should rule the world and white people are evil colonists who have to get in line. I think they might hold the view that like white people have done bad things, but they don't hold the view that white people should be genocided or enslaved. I don't think that, um, Another movie that may or may not have a Thanos situation in that regard is Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. But keep in mind, like, the theme of original Godzilla was was more about nature reacting to man's, like, abuses and the nuclear bomb. It's something kind of Japanese that Westerners don't always pick up on. Should you describe your characters moving around or doing other actions when they have dialogue, like someone clenching their fist, etc., or is this unnecessary fluff? Um, I don't think it's unnecessary fluff. I do it. So if I do it, chances are I think it's not unnecessary. It depends what you want to show with that. So this is a great thing, great way to show some emotions with the character without just telling. Um, you can tell how the character feels. There's big authors that do that, like R.A. Salvatore. Or you could show how the character feels through some action. So, you know, the character clenched his teeth or the character grimaced when he heard this, you know. That shows the reader something about that character. If there's nothing to show, there's no reason to do it. You shouldn't break up dialogue simply because you're tired of seeing a bunch of lines of dialogue. I think it's better to leave it out than to put it in if there's nothing specific that you want to show with it. And so for me, there's many cases where the dialogue just is uninterrupted there's no descriptions interrupting it other than maybe an occasional name Michael said to make sure that the reader's really clear on who's speaking because there's such a long uninterrupted conversation I, I tend to leave a lot of that out but I do put it in if I feel like it it's going to show something if you're doing it after every line of dialogue it's probably too much if you're never doing it you might want to do it a couple times just a little extra characterization um I love the start of The Hobbit. In the Shire, there lived a hobbit. I'm imagining John Huston um, in the Hobbit cartoon. There lived a hobbit. In the hole, there lived a hobbit. Um, I started writing my high fantasy story in first person, in present tense. But you said that past dreams that present tense is a bad idea. I personally hate it, and if somebody was writing in present tense, I would probably not read the book. Um, I think it's very awkward. I think the the style strips all nuance out of what you're doing. Um, with, but at the same time, there's been some big books that did it, notably Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, and also, I think, what's it? Um, the Hunger Games. I think The Hunger Games is in first person, present tense. I go over here. I do that, right? Whereas the Fifty Shades of Grey is just in present tense. He been oh no it's in, that one's in first person presidents. He bends me over the toilet. He like does. The, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to remember it, guys. Don't make me remember those scenes. I'm remembering scenes from. Them. Yes, I've I've forced myself to read some things that I probably shouldn't have just because I'm like, I gotta know why, uh, and it's usually sometimes better not to know. Um, anyway, so yeah the. I, I personally hate present tense. It's really hard for me to get past present tense because I feel like I'm reading a, a screenplay. If I'm reading a screenplay, present tense is fine because the whole point of the action is to lightly describe what you need the director to do, what's happening, and the director is going to figure out all the articulation. If you're writing in past tense, you can have a lot more nuance with what you're doing. There's no nuance to, to present tense, I feel like, and it's it's awful. So I can tell you that if you were writing in present tense, you're know, like, can you read my book? And I saw it and it was in present tense. I'm like, I'm not reading it. I just like, I, I can't do it. I, I hate it too much. Um, how would you make an unlikable character likable? They have to save the cat. They have to do something that makes people like him. So if he's a jerk, if he says, if he calls everybody an asshole all the time, but he saves cats... People might like him anyway. Godzilla is the Tiamat myth. Should I write about mundane stuff? 
if it's done far different than it would be in our world. Like a character taking a shower in 3000 BC era that has magic. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'd, I might describe the shower if it was particularly interesting. Like a showering in zero G I think would be interesting to describe. But showering, you know, using magic, maybe you just say that. You just maybe, maybe do it briefly. It might be interesting, yeah. As long as it's very different from what's mundane. Like you don't want to describe somebody like pooping in a, in a ditch because that's gross, right? <laughs> Have you ever seen the music video for Leonard Nimoy's song The Ballad of Bilbo Baggins? Yes. Thoughts on John Steinbeck? He's okay. I think he's very overrated and he has a lot of hoop to doodle which is good or bad depending on your perspective, meaning he writes uh, these long passages of description. Um, you can actually, if, if you don't like Steinbeck or you find him boring, if you skip all the prose, his books are more readable. <laughs> the characters are usually pretty pretty well done. Sounds like I dodged a bullet by not watching Fifty Shades. I wouldn't watch the movie. What's the point of that? A rated R version of Fifty Shades of Grey. The book's, the book's just bad porn. Might as well read it as bad porn. But, um, when are you going to do your live stream reading of Fifty Shades? When I want to be kicked off of YouTube forever. Might you ever force yourself to read Sacre Bleu? I think I have a copy of it, guys. I don't know nothing about it. But I think I have a copy of it. Somehow. I thought it was a cool cover, and I think someone bought it for me. I read Steve Martin's book, which was really bad. All right. Um, okay, that's enough. That's enough chat. Let me... Uh, I've gotten complaints that I don't get to the lectures quick enough now because I start with chat. It's what this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a seminar. Uh, let me give you a couple strategies for actually drafting your book. And I've gone over these, but I just want to reiterate them before I jump back into the chat and start answering more questions. So here's what I recommend you do to draft your novel. Have a really good beginning. We've talked about how to begin a book. I have content on how to begin a book. Begin a book with characters. Begin a book with action. Describe whatever needs in the setting in between that stuff and lead with dialogue. Okay. Get a good beginning to your book. Um, the more visceral and immediate it is, the better. If you want to ping something epic, you know, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. Find that opening line or write it later. But the main thing is you want to you want to begin with what is makes the reader feel something for a character. You should write 1,000 words a day minimum. You should set that as your target goal. Even if you're a beginner, you can you can crank out a thousand words. It may take you longer than me because I've been doing it, but that's fine. If it takes you three hours to get your first thousand words out, just know that the next day it's going to take you two and a half and. By the end of the book, a thousand words is going to happen really fast. The first thousand words to write is always the hardest. So write your write a thousand words a day minimum. And if you have extra time to spend and you feel energized to do it, keep writing. As long as you feel energized to do extra writing, try to do as much as you can because there's going to be days where you feel defeated and you can't continue. The thousand words is really hard to do or something comes up and you can't write that day. That happens. Um, you know. I really wanted to get started on this book a little earlier, but I just had a lot of stuff come up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of family, this or that, you know, sick kids, stuff that eats up your time, World of Warcraft, you know, stuff like that. So uh, things come up and it's okay if you miss a day, if you are diligent and you work ahead as much as you can. So as much as you're able to work ahead, that's what you should do because you know you're going to miss a day or two in it. Um, when I wrote Needle Ash, I wrote... Uh, all three books in about five weeks and things that happened during that five weeks was a nine day vacation for Thanksgiving. So I lost a whole bunch of days because of Thanksgiving and I still got all my work done because I was very diligent about if I felt energized to work ahead, I worked ahead and that helped me complete the, the process. I recommend a word count goal rather than a time go goal because if you set a time goal, there's nothing to say that you're going to spend those hours efficiently. I figured this out with practicing guitar. People get their guitar out and they're like, I practice four hours a day. I'm like, well, you're not getting any better. What are you doing in there for four hours? And uh, I would I would kind of drop by the practice room to hear one of my students and I'd be like, you, you're not practicing. So I'd drop in and be like, hey, I was listening to you practice outside the door. I know I'm not supposed to listen to you practice. That's private time. But you are not practicing in a way that's going to make you better. You are playing the crap you already know. 
you need to be working on this measure that you're skipping that you can't play yet. Just do that for 30 minutes and you'll actually get better. Um, or, you know, I only see you, I, I timed it and you were practicing, you know, there was sound coming out of your instrument for 20 minutes of the last 30. Should be much higher than that. Should be 29 out of 30 minutes because you might have to stop and take a note on your score or something, right? Uh, most music students were just awful at practicing because they were so inefficient. They didn't do their time right. So it's much better to have a goal for a day. Now, I'm not big on goals. Big goals like my goal is to write a book. Well, I'm going to show you how to do that. What you do after that, you can get post-project depression once you complete a goal. Um, and, and I could talk about this with other things too. If your goal is to get six pack abs, what do you do once you have six pack abs? It's much harder to maintain six pack abs than it is to get them. I know because I've had them, right? It's, it was way harder for me to like keep, you know, stay shredded than it was to get shredded because you, because you're dedicated to that goal. And then once you get it, like, what do you do? It's like, I guess I look good. I guess I look really good. I can have a donut now, right? I'll have a whole box of donuts. Every day of this week. And you're like, where'd my abs go? <laughs> um, so that's real. But goals, a daily goal is a great idea because it'll force you to do it. And I, if you have to-do lists, those can get out of hand like in life. But you should have a to-do list, 1,000 words. Get your 1,000 words in every day and you will complete this project on time. I guarantee it. I will help you do it. Even if those 1,000 words you feel like suck, get them out. You can fix them in revision, and chances are they don't suck as bad as, as you think they do. A lot of times, our discouragement comes from our own internal processes, not what's objectively there on the page. Keep that in mind, okay? So 1,000 words a day, that's a big one. Now, you can set yourself a time, like I'm going to write for two hours, but I wouldn't do that unless you know you can write 1,000 words in two hours. You want to have 1,000 words written. And what's great about writing a book versus practicing guitar is that the goal is extremely tangible. A thousand words, your word processor will tell you exactly how many words you've written. I'm looking at my document and it says 2,264 words. And I got about, I know there's a, about 200 words more to finish off this first chapter. Bam. I got the first chapter written in one day. I'm going to write another chapter tonight or tomorrow. And that'll be good, you know. So, Stick to the word count goal. I promise you that is what's going to deliver you your your goal that you want. Next thing, we've been talking about technique in the in the questions. Here's what you really need to know about technique. Um, if prose is accurately describing what you see, what you hear, and what you smell, whatever. If it's accurately describing your senses, the prose is doing its job. You don't need to worry about writing fancy flirt prose like John Steinbeck, right? John Steinbeck writes, write, he writes very good prose. A lot of people get bored by his prose though. So if the prose is functional, I consider it for the purposes of this project superior to prose, which is technically artistic or technically impressive on some level, right? Uh, and I notice just from my own experience, you know, I don't write, I don't always just write simple prose. But the more complex the prose I write, the more confused readers get by it. And it's not because I'm bad at writing prose, because I often have people read who aren't, English isn't their first language. And so if I'm writing, you know, if I'm using sentence structure from the 18th or 19th century, which to a, a native English speaker might sound a little bit weird, but to like a, a writer, it sounds really cool to somebody who's not a deep English reader, somebody who knows that as a second, second language, or just somebody who's a, a casual reader of books, they're going to have to read that sentence two or three times. That needs means I need to, to go with a more straightforward approach sometimes. I don't always do that because I always write what I want to write no matter what anyway, but it's something I've learned is that uh, if I if I try to write really technically impressive prose, if I'm, if I'm working with the medium too much, people don't like it. They, they get turned off by it big time. So if you're writing functional prose, that's what you need to happen. You need to accurately describe what's there. You know, you could write it in single sentences, no compound sentences, and then a revision, turn a couple of them into better sounding sentences. That's all you need to do. Let's see here. Let's see here. Which Steve Martin book did you read? Uh, it's called An Object of Beauty. It's simply very bad. It's very boring. 
There's no conclusion, no plot. It's basically literary fiction. So it's about characters who are unlikable, doing unlikable things, and then the book ends. It's bad. Uh, maybe I'll do an analysis of it. My wife read it, and she's like, I got to the end, and I hated it. I'm like, yeah. By the time I got to the end, I hated all the characters and wanted them to, to like commit suicide and die. Um, but then they didn't. But nothing resolves. It just kind of ends. It's like, all right, that's the end. I ran out of ideas. I'm going to stop writing today. There you go. Fantasy Fan says, I'm doing my story in third-person limited point of view. However, recently been reading some older pulp-style material and have grown fond of the third-person omniscient campfire style. Thoughts? A limited point of view is more popular now. And it depends on what kind of story you want to write. So there's different ways to approach this stylistically. This is a great question for how to execute this, this pro stuff. So let's say that you, uh, I'll use one of my books as an example. So um, I actually don't think the separation between quote limited and omniscient, limited, omniscient, whatever you want. I don't think that separation is quite as hard as it appears at first glance. So a limited point of view or personal point of view means you're only giving the insight of the thoughts or perspectives of one care of limited number of characters, usually one. Omniscient means you're really you're giving the thoughts and insights for anyone that's in the scene. Now, if you read something like Shogun by James Clavell or any of James Clavell's books, he does omniscient style and he kicks ass at it. It's it's not what modern readers are super accustomed to. Um, it doesn't mean you, you can't ever do it. But for Crown of Sight, what I did was I wrote in a very, very neutral style. Um, it's actually third person omniscient, but it's very limited in that I don't really give any insights into anybody's thoughts. The narrator, as you will, is completely neutral to any given scene, but I imagine the, the okay, let me describe it this way. I wanted it to be like a movie. So I imagine that the narrator is the camera. So in a given scene, the camera focuses on a character. You know, it's focusing on Talel, right? Um, you know, let me just read a, a line of prose. Talel threw another knife. It slid its way through the armor of the Dryson. The enchanted edge slicing through the steel mail like it was paper. It stopped halfway into the gray skin's neck. Dark blood erupted as he slid off of his horse, landing near the first scout Talel had killed, a human. The elf looked over his shoulder and nodded. Marjorie padded up, his sword drawn. He was followed by the rest of the scouts who bore bows and crossbows. Now, we're really focused on Talel there, but notice we're not really giving any insights into what Talel feels or sees. So far, so good, Talel said to the captain. Marjorie peered around the boulder, taking in the steep slope up to the enemy palisade. Oh, oh, well, now we're, we're with Marjorie's perspective, right? Uh, taking in the steep slope up to the enemy palisade, tracing the wooden fortifications with his eyes until they disappeared into the night. So you would think it was a, a more limited point of view till you get to Marjorie, and then it's kind of focused on Marjorie, but I'm not getting in their heads. So the narrator's really out of the way. Uh, it's a very neutral narrator to me. Um, do you think we can remain hidden? Talel nodded. Well enough to get close, yes. The problem will be getting away. We have two horses now. Maybe that is enough. I wonder if Terra ever arrived at the first meeting point, Talel said. Now, and I'm, I'm giving the information through dialogue there. Rather than, sit, rather than doing that through prose, or you could probably do that through thoughts if you're doing the limited perspective. It would be something like, rather than him saying, I wonder, Talel wondered if Terra had ever arrived at the first meeting point. It's not dialogue, it's internal, right? So I'm putting most of that stuff out in, out in the dialogue so that the the uh, omniscient, you know, the omniscient uh, narrator can remain really neutral. Now, it's not omniscient in that he, the narrator does not, I'm not telling you what the enemy sees. I'm focusing just on the allies, the characters that are present in the scene and their perspectives. Um, so I don't think this, I don't think the line is quite as, as strong as people often think. They often think, oh, over yonder is third person omniscient and, and thence we shall not go 
in modern literature. And over here is third person personal, which everyone writes, and this is very comfortable and feels good. And it's very character focused and yummy, right? Uh, I think you can, you know, like, like the style that I use in this one, it's really omniscient, but it's very personal at times because we give the insights for all, any given character that's in the scene. To me, this is more like, well, it's not really like Clavel at all. I shouldn't say that. It's more like Clavel in that you can kind of, you're kind of moving between focuses in a scene, uh, but it's not like Clavel at all in that I just don't use thoughts. You know, if you're reading James Clavel, he'll frequently just jump into the thoughts of a character to provide insight on that character. And then then you're at the other character in the across, sitting across from him in the same scene. So you could do either one. I like Omniscient. I don't think there's any market reason not to do it other than people don't do it a lot. So I don't think very many readers would read it and get turned off. The first book I wrote was in Omniscient and I had feedback early on that was like, I this, this feels weird. And I took it into account. I'm like, okay, a lot of readers are just not familiar with the style. What should I do with that? And I'm like, well, you know, if I can limit or uh, make the, the transitions between focuses, like it's who the camera's pointing at, right? When I say that um, Marjorie was like looking up at the palisade, I'm imagining the camera is looking up on him and then the camera's looking up on the palisade. Like I'm, I'm really imagining it as a movie and just kind of translating it into a book experience. And so a lot of people who read this were like this, it's like I'm watching a movie, but I'm reading it in a book format, but it's not a script either. Uh, that's a hard thing to do, but I, I like that experiment. It's not as popular as Vo Voices of the Void, partly because I gave this one away for free to lots of people, and I gave this one a free away to free to nobody. I just was like, buy it. If you like my crap, buy it. I think it's great. If I were to pick between these two as far as which one I think is more me, it's actually this one. It's Crown of Sight. Voices of the Void is still very me, but it's highly experimental. It's I had no idea what whether people would like this or not because it was so out there and I hadn't read anything like it. And technically, I did a bunch of weird things that you probably shouldn't do, but I just wanted to try them out. Like no scene breaks. There's no scene breaks whatsoever in Voices of the Void. It goes straight through 24,000 words beginning to the end. No scene breaks, no time breaks, nothing. It's just like... Uh, that probably shouldn't do that, but I did it. Because I do whatever I want to do all the time anyway. How do you build self-discipline? Great question. From Jorge, war crimes or George war crimes. Um, how do you build self-discipline? You build it one brick at a time, just like a wall. Start with one thing that you do every day that you never renege on. So if you're doing your thousand words, you do your thousand words a day, no matter how long it takes you to get those thousand words out. From there, you build discipline in other things. Now you can have a life that is too disciplined in the sense that if you have a life that's too ascetic, um, like is completely lacking pleasure, I think you're going to be miserable. I think you can enjoy pleasure if you know you've earned it. So if the more discipline you build, the more you'll enjoy your time off from being disciplined. So, you know, if nothing feels quite as good, <laughs> is getting back from the gym and like playing a video game. You know, like you've done everything you need to do for the day. You have a few hours left over. There's no one telling you what to do or what not to do. You feel free to enjoy that game and there's no guilt. There's nothing on the back of your mind going like, I shouldn't be doing this, I should be doing something else. Um, so the, the better you are at self-discipline, the better you'll feel about doing things which are, are pleasurable. Um, so start with one thing and then do things from there. Now, there's other things you could do too. This is a, so I had a friend ask a question, kind of some, somewhat related to this, this course. How do you, how do you do creative things when you just don't feel it? When you're just not feeling creative, you just don't feel like creating, you just don't feel like doing it, how do you do it? And the answer is, well, you got to do something. You know, if, if absolutely you can't stand to be creative in that moment, go to the gym wash the dishes. I don't know. But you got to do something that moves you forward. What you shouldn't do is watch TV when you don't feel creative. What you shouldn't do is nothing. What you shouldn't do is avoid something that will make you grow. Instead, do something else that'll make you grow. If you don't feel like writing, try to edit a chapter, right? Look at it from a critical eye. Uh, you don't have to feel real creative to, to look at what you've written from a critical eye and make alterations. And in fact, that can actually spur on creativity. So if you're having some difficulties writing or feeling 
creative or energized to write, you can go back and edit something you've already written. Just look at it, revise it a little bit, and sometimes that'll trigger you to, to feel in a good place to write as well. Um, so that's something that's, that's there. You gotta do something with your time that's gonna move you forward, and you'll feel a lot better as a result of that. Um, Sometimes I force myself to write all that comes out as horse manure. Most things come to me in strange states or in specific moments and then I write it. How does one just write? I don't know, man. I sit down and do it. I know what I'm gonna write. That's the other thing. I know what the story is. I know what the scene looks like. I know it all. So it's just a matter of executing. For me, there's never a question of I don't know what to write. The only time I don't know what to write is when the thing that I felt like was next I think is bad and I have to rethink about what I'm writing and re basically rewrite the story before I bring it in. So I do lots of planning and then bring it onto the page. So I never really have a problem with that. Um, I would say if you feel like it's crap or horse manure, don't judge it as you write it. Judge it some other time. And then do the same thing for the things that you feel good about. And you may find that they're actually quite similar, that your feelings aren't really affecting your technique. It's mostly technique, right? Like if I, if I don't feel super creative, I could still peel a guitar, you know, or if I don't feel like really expressive, I could still pull a guitar off the wall and play a song I know, and it'll probably sound the same as when I felt really alive and loved that song because it's all technique, you know? There's, there's not that much variation between I'm super passionate about the song and I'm executing the technique that I've practiced a thousand times before, 10,000 times before. Um, so the story doesn't need to sound massively fancy like Pride and Prejudice. Absolutely not. Pride and Prejudice isn't a super fancy story. Um, and the prose isn't even that fancy. It's pretty typical for 19th century prose. Uh, Pride and Prejudice is mostly about the dialogue and the characters. That's why people still like it. I don't like it, though. If you like it, that's okay. But I don't like it. I find it boring. Thoughts on Charles Dickens. So Charles Dickens, um, kind of like Melville... I almost recommend abridged versions because Charles Dickens wrote books in a time when books were supposed to be long to provide a value of entertainment. It's kind of like if you buy a 100-hour Witcher 3 game, but only like 40 hours of it is story. That's annoying, right? So that's kind of what most Dickens books are. Like if you read Great Expectations, there's a, there's a good story in there. The problem is it's only about 40% of the book, and the rest of it is superfluous nothing that... It was entertaining or funny when it was written in like the 1860s, but just doesn't really relate to people today. So uh, that's my opinion on Charles Dickens. Of course, he wrote good stories and his dialogue was probably good for the time that it was written, although it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to modern readers. Um, same thing, I mean, even with like Sir, Sir Walter Scott, right? You know, I like, I like Sir Walter Scott, but like half the book you could probably skip and not, not lose track of what is essential to the story. But just back then, they wrote a lot of extra stuff that wasn't the core story, just characterization, scenes that were entertaining on their own. You know, when you paid 10 cents for a novel, you wanted a lot of time with that novel to get your 10 cents out. 10 cents was a lot back then, by the way. <laughs> you know, 10 cents or 10 pence wasn't always just worthless, you know. 10 cents used to buy you good stuff. You used to be able to buy guns for like five bucks, you know. <laughs> uh, CS 499 super chat thank you that's a good price for a book by the way got inspired and wrote a summary with Axe should I write a novel or screenplay though I think in terms of visual scenes but the novel is an easier sell the screenplay is not a sale so you only sell a screenplay to someone that's going to produce it into a movie you're not going to like you can't really sell them on Amazon there's not a market for them I mean, you can do it like you could put a screenplay screenplay up for sale to see if someone will read it as if it is a novel, but people aren't really going to do it. Like the market isn't isn't interested in that. They're interested in a in narrative because narrative provides all the information that's missing in a screenplay. You know, provides the prose tells you what's going on. So you really, if you're going to try to publish it on Amazon, you should write it in narrative format rather than, or you know, a book format rather than a screenplay. If you are looking to produce a screenplay yourself or you're looking to sell it to somebody who wants to produce it or you have a friend who's interested in producing screenplays, then totally you can write a screenplay. And it's actually not that hard to adapt a screenplay into a novel or vice versa, depending on how you've written it. 
Crown of Sight, I could turn into a 130 page screenplay. That's not Crown of Sight. There's Crown of Sight. <laughs> I can turn that into a 130 page screenplay by copy pasting the dialogue and like rewriting the prose. So it's, it's not that hard to go either way, but uh, I, would, I would probably do the, the novel if you're planning to sell it. All right. A book where all the characters are unlikable to the point that you want them to die in the end doesn't sound good at all. I'm very judgmental of characters. So if there's no one exhibiting any virtue or I find everybody ridiculously immature or boorish, I'm just like, I kind of want like... I. I kind of want a meteor to come out of the sky and kill someone so something interesting happens. I don't think I've ever heard of that book. I've read two short humor books by Steve Martin and liked them. So this is Steve Martin's novel. It's called An Object of Beauty. It's not funny. It's not really very interesting. I read the whole thing. Um, you know, I was slightly interested at the beginning, but then like, just it's it's kind of like reading anything that's literary fiction. It just kind of goes nowhere. It's not written to be entertaining. Um, yeah, Bowfinger's funny. Steve Martin's comedy is great. His little one-act plays are great. His novel, An Object of Beauty, I don't think is good. He's also like a great banjo player, by the way, too. Any opinions on Eric Van Lustbader's writing? Nope. No opinions, sorry. Um, let's see here. Might you try the free book writing software YWriter5 sometime? I'd like to see what you think of it. It has many book specific features that ordinary word processors like MS Word lack. I can't think of a single feature that is lacking on Microsoft Word, not one. I'll, I mean, I can try it, but it's gonna be introducing features that I already have no use for. So I could tell you that right now. So I'm probably just gonna be like, maybe you guys will like these features. I don't need them, right? I don't, I just don't need the features that these writing programs have. I've never needed them and I don't, I don't know. If you need them, that's fine. I'm not judging you for wanting features in a in software. Software should have the features that you want. I'm just saying I don't have a use for them. You know, kind of like Quigley, that last scene. It's like, I always said I prefer a long gun. I, was, <laughs> I never said I didn't know how to use it. You know, I said I didn't prefer it. I never said I didn't know how to use it. It's this handgun. Um, you know, I like, I like just a clean document. Words going on the document. I don't need other features. But MS Word's great for formatting too. So there's some there's a lot of efficiency that you gain with MS Word. Um, I do I format all my books, all my interiors in Microsoft Word. I don't do it in InDesign. I could do it in InDesign, but it would take like way long. So I wouldn't do that unless like there was I had to be so anally specific about the about the formatting. I had to make it so perfect that I couldn't do it in Word. But even then, I've done I've done crazy stuff like like custom drop caps and all kinds of wacky things in my books. Actually, I think I have a copy of Bible. Okay, this is the old version, but it still has the right stuff in it. Okay, hopefully you guys can see this a little bit. Let me get the right angle here. Yeah, so this drop cap, this W um, with these ravens, this is not a font you can download. I made this W. <laughs> I created this. Each one of these drop caps is a custom creation that I did. Uh, personally, me. <laughs> I did not write these. You know, I didn't download a font for these. Every single one is custom and none of them are repeated, even if it's the same letter. I made a new drop cap. So here's the letter T. Uh, you, I think you could see it. You could see there's like a bird landing on the T. Every single drop cap's like that. I did that on purpose. I you know. Here's another T, it's a different bird. Sorry for the pop. There you go. Right, so I, do, I can do all that stuff in Microsoft Word. Now I made the caps in a different program. I made them in Inkscape, not Photoshop. By the way, Inkscape, because I can make them as as vectors, and there's some bit tracing stuff. I, I could try to do that sometime. I think I actually have a video on how I created them. Let's see here. How do I make dialogue seem more human? At times, it just comes off naturally to me. Others, I feel like I'm making two robots talk. Say it out loud, and then 
imagine somebody said that to you and they're autistic and you're like, you want to correct them and show them the correct way to do it. And then you'll probably be writing natural dialogue. But, you know, sometimes some people talk different from other people. I would say it's a good idea of making it natural, but you don't want to go too far in the other direction where like somebody's talking in a bunch of slang that just makes you seem ignorant. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say it out loud. That's what I do. Spider-Man 2 explored the consequences of an overly ascetic life very well. Yeah. Um, you played it Fire Emblem. You played Fire Emblem Three Houses. I did. What did you think of uh, Edelgard? Good girl or the best girl? I don't know. I like Edelgard as a character. I think she's interesting. You know, I think she's got a lot of layers there that are fun to fun to fun to look at. I found. I, I think I found the most interesting reveal of a character to be. Um, flame the the blue the like blue haired girl where she's like i've never done this once in all of my life and it's like but you're like 16 aren't you it's like nope <laughs> nope so i i you know I, I liked those there's some some subtlety there that they did that was uh that was kind of fun it's like wait a minute why would you say all of your life uh, i hope I, I say i picked up on this stuff immediately because that's exactly how i would have written it but you know I just noticed you have Helga on your door. Yes, that is the art by um, Karen Byatt that I licensed for the cover. It's a licensed piece of art. It's not, I didn't hire him to draw a new cover because I needed to get it done quickly and my budget was limited. So I licensed that. That is a that is a cheaper option. So you can find people on DeviantArt and you just like license their stuff for a cover if they're good and you can do it for pretty cheap. I'll talk about that when we get to publishing. And maybe I'll do that because I can't imagine... Um, I can't imagine doing a Photoshop cover for this story I'm writing. It's just, uh, it'd be so much like, um, you know, let me, let me pull something up for you guys. I'll show you, let me show you John De La Rose's new cover. It's awesome. Let me find it. Dang it. Come on. I re I retweeted this cover. Yeah, he just came out with this yesterday and it already went bestseller. He sold a ton of copies. Did a great job. He did a great job with this launch. Come on. Come on. Let me find it. Yeah, here it is. All right. Okay, streaming software. Show me. All right. Here's what the book looks like. This is like a Space Templar book. It's like beating me to the punch, but it's great. Mine's gonna be different. Mine's more horror focused. His is like heroic fantasy, but in space. So this is like a really great piece of custom artwork for the cover. It does everything. It's got high contrast. It's got the humanized figure. Um, you know, you're going from black all the way to these bright sunbeams, which is great. You have a planet, every, the, which has the, the correct um, genre in it. Um, you have this laser sword, which right away you're like, I want to just like Star Wars. Uh, great, of course, great work here with the um, with the lettering. Um, this might actually be somehow photoshopped, but it looks like some kind of other kind of custom art. Let me see if I could find. Um, he actually has all three covers done. He did all three covers at the same time. Hey, he retweeted my book! Yay! Voices of the Void. It's good. It's good, guys. I can't find. He, he already did all three covers. And um, and they look really good. So the second cover has a hot girl on it. Um, Delarose.com. He's got to have it up here. Yeah, Justified. I don't see the other covers. He's got two other covers already, and they look good. I'll show them some other time, maybe when I'm talking about covers. But this nails the genre so perfectly. Like you can't really, you can't really say like it would be any better for what he's doing. Space Templar, dude with a laser sword in badass power armor that still looks medieval with planets and exploding crap in space. It's like perfect. You know, you, you look at that, and you're like, I know exactly what I'm gonna get when I look at this book. So it's great. Um, I don't know how I got on that. 
but yeah, that's it's great. So I'm, I might uh, I might be like cruising through DeviantArt to find somebody who done something like that already, like a Warhammer 40k take or something. Just be like, hey, can I license your crap? Here's 50 bucks. Here's 100 bucks, and I'll put it out. Hard. It's kind of hard when you're writing like 99 cent fiction to make back 100 bucks though. Just keep that in mind. You have to sell 300 copies. That's not hard, that hard for me, but it's going to be a lot harder for you if you've never published a book. 300 copies is a lot to sell when you have zero platform and you haven't done this. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, unrelated question, are you gonna take down this stream or have it unlisted? No. No, I, 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 I leave them all uploaded. Uh, the only time they ever go down or become unlisted is because uh, there is some kind of other issue about why I don't want them up. Like, um, you know, they talk about, maybe they talk about like some kind of e-drama thing that becomes outdated. I'll take it down because it, I don't want any false information out there. Um, you know, if the video becomes outdated, I'll take it down, but that's really rare. And I never talk about drama stuff. I've talked about, like, I had a couple comics videos and I, or comics gate videos. And I think like two of those went unlisted simply because the, the information on them became rapidly out of date, which means if somebody was watching it in the future, it just wouldn't. It would be in. It would be missing. It'd be misinformation, misinformative. I don't want that. Uh, so otherwise, they'll all stay up. Yeah. Show don't tell is pretty much drilled into everyone's head when it comes to storytelling. But are there instances when it's better to tell than show? Absolutely. And uh, it comes down to this: efficiency. It's so much more efficient to say how a person feels than to try to show them show how they feel, especially with something complex. And in some cases, you have characters who their exterior needs to not reflect their interior, so you must tell. Otherwise, you cannot communicate what the character is feeling. So if the character, you know, has a rock hard exterior, but inside his guts feel churned, you have to describe that he feels like his guts are churning or he felt rather than saying he felt sad inside or he kept his rock hard exterior even though he felt sad inside you're still telling in a situation like that telling is just way more efficient it's way easier to just say how someone feels or say how something is rather than describe it in an indirect fashion i talk about this with direct versus indirect exposition direct exposition it's so much more efficient and the truth is i would rather as a reader read direct exposition telling rather than info dumps which are indirect so if you have to do an info dump in the middle of some kind of prose, it annoys me. Just tell me what I need to know and get on with it. In fact, it'd be better if you tell it in some kind of intro. Um, or find a way to spread the information out so you don't have to in info dump. So yeah, there's many instances where you tell, not show. In fact, the entire thing is stupid because this is a written medium. You cannot show. You, It's impossible to show in a book. Because what are you showing? You're showing words. You show, don't tell when it comes to comics and movies and stuff like that. Or on stage, you show, don't tell. But in a book, you have to, you are only telling in a literal sense. So it just depends how direct or indirect you want to be with, with how you're describing something. You know, a lot of people would say you should be entirely indirect, but it just depends how quickly you need to get the information out there. I find if, if it saves you a lot of space, it's better to tell sometimes. Uh, but you're going to have to fill that out for yourself. Um, I find that most 19th and early 20th century horror is written in first person. Do you think that's the best to write in first person when trying to evoke Poe, Stoker, Lovecraft, etc.? A lot of Lovecraft is not written in first person, by the way. He only wrote in first person about like 40% of the time. He just Some of his most well-known uh, books are in first person. But even when he writes in first person, he does things that are a little outside that, where he is it's first person but you're reading a hist but you're reading different documents uh, that are in first person to kind of construct a sort of a third person viewpoint um it depends so here's the advantage of first person if you're writing in first person you are in the eyes you're in the eyes of the main character which means you can completely focus on how they feel you can viscerally you can have an visceral feelings be described about their them wanting to throw up or them, you know, how they perceive things. You can get really into the perception of how you want the reader to feel, which is great. There's a whole lot of technical stuff you can do there. You could read Lovecraft for that. He was a master at it. But he could do it in third person as well. 
but the real advantage to first person is that you can focus on details in a longer, in a much more dedicated way. If you're in a third person perspective, you know, you you tend to describe more things in less detail. Whereas in first person, you can really, you know, um, I went up to the, to the lamppost and I touched it and it felt cold, freezing in fact, and I pulled my hand away and I saw that my fingers were getting red as if I had been holding ice. Whereas in third person, you might be, he, you could describe it that way, but it, it would, uh, you might feel tempted to describe extra details. Whereas in first person, the person is never going to describe anything that's not out of the ordinary for them. Um, so that makes first person to me less ideal for fantasy because there's so many things that you want to describe or science fiction, same thing. But you can, you know, it depends how you how you want to do it. Uh, you can get a lot more visceral with first person and have it feel really natural. Uh, so much chat, sorry. How do you introduce a character's fatal flaw? You've got to show them doing it. Um, so if they have a flaw, let's say their flaw is money. You just show them being bad with money. Just show them like opening up their wallet and it's empty and they realize that they spent their money on something stupid. There you go. Or they trip over their words in front of a girl. Just show that. Just show them doing that. Just find a way to put that in there. Um, preferably in the first third of the story. Lord Stuart, Stuart, have you ever read The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe? I haven't. I think you'd enjoy it. Thanks. It delves into the theory of mythology and explores how it develops. Yeah, maybe I'll check it out. Um, is it a good idea to tease the idea that the narrator in a first person story might be a ghost in order to fool the audience into thinking he might die yes I like that idea I think that's a good idea so I had a friend who wrote a story in first person and his original way he introduced it was like the character describing his own death from the first person perspective and then like being in hell. So you're, you know, that's that's a way to kind of kind of shake that. Have you ever read any Japanese manga or watched Japanese anime? I have. What are your thoughts on the Mission Impossible movies? I haven't watched any of them past the first one. I mean, past the second one. And I didn't like the second one, so. I wrote on Google Docs because it's on my phone. Yeah, Google Docs is fine. I find myself thinking the plot of my story and then I realize that the main character could be opposite gender. How do I not get too plot heavy and dive more into character? Um, have characters talk to each other is the best advice. If characters talk to each other, they have a chance to reveal things about themselves. Um, usually most characterization happens in a either what's either in a preparation or a reaction. So you think with any plot point, there's an event that happens. There's a preparation, something that sets up that event or leads up to it. The event happens and then there's a reaction. So your characterization is going to happen on either side of the event. <laughs> let's say the event is a car crash. You know, or let, let's, let's say the event is like someone getting shot, right? So you have the conversation which is establishing two characters walking alone in an alley out pops the robber and shoots him shoots the people and he says and then you have two characters react to that afterwards like oh my god he's shot someone call an ambulance and on the ambulance ride they talk you know they can express things maybe the character dies and they have a chance to express what they're what they're feeling and their opinions about death and the afterlife um, their faith there's so many opportunities for characterization and the before and the after so the before is the setup the after the reaction is where all, all the best characterization tends to take place this is what shakespeare did so the exposition of his plays was um really focused around just showing the characters talking to each other and revealing their desires their hopes their dreams their ambitions 
then you'd have a big reactionary event like Julius Caesar getting killed or uh, you know Macbeth killing the king or whatever and and then the characters react they talk about how they feel with each other and that's where you get into the meat of the characterization so a lot of the characterization in Shakespeare happens in the third act the middle of the play because that's where the characters are reacting to what's going on that's where they're really changing and uh, reacting and preparing for the final acts and then the uh, you get the last bit of characterization at the end of the fifth act, the reaction to whatever closes the plot. Um, would you consider watching and reviewing Mission Impossible 6? They made six of them? Oh my god. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the upcoming Joker movie? No thoughts. I- I've only been seeing Twitter takes. And th- I see a picture of the guy playing Joker. I'm like, this looks bad. But I, I can't judge that. What's the best way to go about making a map for a large fantasy world? I am so glad you asked that, Adon Wolf. I have, I have a video on the subject, so search my my channel for how to make a fantasy map. Um, I'll so I show how I drew these maps behind me, like that map. Show exactly how I did it from a technical technical way. You can do it on paper or you can do it in Photoshop. The one behind me was done in Photoshop and nobody noticed that I did it in Photoshop instead of doing it on paper first. Um, you can do it a bunch of different ways. Uh, the first one I did on paper and then I did a basically a bit tracing of it in Inkscape to make it look really sharp and professional and put it in uh, Water of Awakening. Um, other people use Campaign Cartographer. You could use, uh, what's it called? There's another one that I'm thinking of uh, that's that's pretty free. You could actually use that one uh, to, what's it called? Something Scape. I don't remember. Uh, Incarnate, Incarnate, that's what it's called. So you can use Incarnate. Incarnate Worlds is a, is a web applet. You could use that, download the JPEG, and then trace over it or draw on top of it after you construct your map. There's a whole bunch of ways to do it. I can do a video just on that if you want. I've done a couple videos already. Um, but I could talk about a few of them. There's also a guy who I've uh, done content with before named Jesper Schmidt. He has a whole bunch of stuff on fantasy map making, including a book called Fantasy Map Making uh, that you can read to get a whole bunch of insight into how he does maps and how he thinks maps are done well. Uh, If you want to go overload on information, he's got a lot of info for it. Film Girl, sorry for my annoying questions, uh, but I have another one. They're not annoying. What's the best way to make um, my made up world believable? just so it doesn't sound too unimaginable, if that makes sense. So if the if the characters believe it, the reader's going to believe it a lot more. So the characters need to react to the fantastic as if it's the mundane. And uh, that's the best way I can do it. So think about Harry Potter, because I know you guys have seen Harry Potter and read Harry Potter. Half the people go, like, I hate Harry Potter. It's like Harry Potter does a lot of things well. So the magical people, I don't, the non-muggles, what are they called, wizards, whatever. They're wizards if they're men and witches if they're girls. Anyway, they, um, you know, Harry, who's, this is all new to him, is always reacting to what they do. So they do things that are quite fantastical, but to them it's normal. And so you believe it because the characters believe it. There's nothing believable about throwing, like, whatever, throwing powder into a fireplace and hopping out of a flu in East London, right? There's nothing believable about that. You believe it because it's mundane to the characters. The characters believe it. So that's the best advice I can give. Um, show the characters believing it and the, the reader will be along for the ride. Uh, the inclusion writer was first announced. I have no idea what you're talking about, Hardwick. Inclusion Rider was first announced in September 2018. was apparently due to the AT&T buyout. I have no idea what you're talking about. I found the friend who's willing to design my cover for free. I told him I'd treat him to food or a drink, and he's like, yeah, I'd totally do that for you. There you go. Have you worked with an editor before, or do you need a publisher to assign you one? Great question. Uh, I don't work with editors, really, because there's a bunch of things. I've gone into it before. Um, for this project... You probably don't want to spend the money on an editor for short work. If you are going the traditional publishing route, um, they will handle editing and proofreading and will work with you on that. 
maybe, but usually they're going to. Uh, if you are going the independent publishing route, you have to find your own editor to work with that is wanting to work with you. Now, the best advice I can give for finding one is find the best author and see if you can figure out if he has an editor, if, if he's in your genre and work with that person rather than one of the worst things to do is to find authors that appear to be publishing independent books and then try to hire them to try to hire them to um, to edit your book and I'm I'm trying to think of an of a way to say this that isn't like super insulting but the reality is there's a lot of writers on Twitter who don't make any money publishing books and so they're always saying I'm uh, you know I'm available for editing I'm available to edit is something that they say like all the time. Kind of beware about that because it's not that they're going to be necessarily a bad editor, but if they're not doing this at a high enough level that they they have to be editing other people's books all the time to pay the rent, could be that the industry is bad, which is partly true, but it could be just that like that's not going to be a person you need editing your book. There's a lot of people like creative writing degrees who who think they know how to edit books. Um, it's just, man, it's hard to find, it's hard to find somebody who's competent with that. The, the advantage of an editor is that you're only dealing with feedback from one person rather than like 20 people, right? A reader feedback can be hard to sift, to sift through. That's if you can get people to read it. So, um, that's my whole, as much as I could probably say on editing for this project, we're not going to, we're going to focus on self editing and revision rather than trying to hire editors who are going to tell you what you got to fix about your book. You're going to try to figure that out for yourself because editors can also get very expensive. Um, I've known several authors who've dumped a thousand dollars on editing services and then not gotten anything back from that. So it's an investment that doesn't necessarily yield returns. It's different from buying a piece of capital equipment that you make microchips on that gives you a return. It's like it doesn't necessarily lead to returns uh, at all. So you got to think it from a business perspective. You, you wouldn't just hire somebody as an editor because you think it's a necessary step. Only if you think that it's necessary uh, or is it going to drastically improve your product would I, would I really think about that. Um, I looked up John De La Rose. His work looks interesting. Have you read anything by him? Yes. I've read several several of his books. I've read The Stars Entwined, which is a little space opera book he wrote. It's it's good. Uh, his steampunk stuff is, is a lot of fun. It's young adult focused, but uh, I enjoy it. It's well-written books. He's got the all the basics of story are there, and he hammers them out really well. Uh, all his characters are pretty likable, and they're fast reads. They're they're easy to get through in a short amount of time. Not that they're short reads, but they're easy to read. Um, you don't ever feel bogged down in his stories, which is what you want. You never want to get read. If you're reading a story and you're like, "What's going on? When are we getting to something interesting?" It means that that the story's not focused enough. So his stories are always very focused, which is good. Um, when do you use italics and bolded words in your works? So italics I use to communicate thoughts. And bolded words, I almost never use. But I sometimes use them if there's an internal dialogue between somebody with split personalities. But italics I usually use for thoughts. Um, but you could just use quotes for thoughts. You can just avoid italics and bolded stuff entirely. It's up to you. There's no manual for style for how to do that right. I just use italics for thoughts if I want to communicate an internal thought. Coke Zero looks so good right now. It's kind of, It's gotten kind of warm. But I still like it. I have a full-time job. Would you suggest popping over to the library to write or just do so at home? Does it even matter? I feel like I may write more efficiently out of home. If it if you write more efficiently out of home, do that. A lot of people write in coffee shops because it's just not home. When you're at home, you tend to get overwhelmed by the stuff at home. Um, so yeah, I think... Finding an environment that you feel comfortable and focused writing in. A library is a great environment because there's just less distractions. You can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to take a break, go play some Fire Emblem. Or it's like, I sit at this, I had this massive, powerful PC. 
you know, someone asked if my PC specs and then I listen to them and they're like, crap. I'm like, that's, this sounds like the best PC ever. I'm like, dude, it's five years old. This PC sucks <laughs> by my standards, right? By my standards, this is an old computer, but it's like, I could play every game in ultra settings. It's really easy to just be like, I'll just play World of Warcraft for 10 minutes. I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm just going to do one quest. And then I look at the clock and it's like, I need to go to bed, <laughs> you know, uh-oh. Um, so if you're, if I was at the library, obviously it'd be a little bit harder for me to play World of Warcraft. I say that, but I actually had a portable install of Classic WoW that connected to a private server that I could plug into a computer at the library and run. Oh boy, I was very good at avoiding work. Um, what's your favorite manga or anime? Um, Shurigui is, um, or Shigirui is one of my favorites. Uh, it's about samurai. Um, as far as manga, uh, that's one of my favorite mangas. And the anime is great too. Berserk is uh, probably my favorite anime, um, or my favorite manga, sorry. I like the, the first anime series quite a bit. But uh, Berserk tends to just kind of wander around after volume like 15 or so. So there's good and bad things about it. But it's drawn and told pretty well. I love the themes of it. Um, I'm considering changing the places of the protagonist of love interest after the first act because a lot of the plot afterwards is really her story. Yeah, you can do that. You can always switch perspectives. So as long as you can put a scene break in it, you can switch perspectives. And whenever you do a scene break where you switch perspectives, what you want to do is you want to lead with the name of the character who you are focusing on. So you have the scene break. I usually do an asterisk. So I have a line break, asterisks, asterisk, asterisk. New paragraph, Jaina, Jaina opened the drawer and looked at a field of pink shirts. She realized I don't like pink, right? So you just right away with the focus of the new character. Uh, how do you decide the gender of your characters? I, this is gonna sound weird. I don't decide it. They are just part of the story. It's just how it is. I don't make, I don't make a lot of the decisions people think I make. I Stories pop into my head kind of like Athena, fully formed. And then I write them. I know that sounds really bad. Like I just kind of write down the details and then I begin writing the book. Um, but I don't. Like, you know, Helga was always a woman. I never thought, am I going to write a, am I going to write a story about a woman or a man? It was just like, I had this story pop in my head when I was driving to Bakersfield. I'm like, and it was always a girl. It was always a woman right from the beginning. It was always a woman. And yes, it is a little harder to write a woman if you're a man simply because you're not a woman. And so the female perspective is alien to you. It's foreign to you. But um, hopefully you spend enough time with women that it's not completely alien and that you have no idea what a woman might think or what a woman's perspective might be and how it might be different than a man's. Joaquin Phoenix is the new Joker. I like Joaquin Phoenix. Regarding the inclusion writer, you missed the comment. I had written before that one. All right. Thank you. I'm struggling with mapping out all the events of Act 2 and making them not have a mundane feel to them. Most of the development happens, so how do I keep it interesting? So um, here's a little bit of a technique thing. So every thousand words, something should happen. So every two pages. Um, at the minimum, there needs to be some kind of event that is important and that the characters have to react to, either a conversation or a, uh, you know, something. There has to be something happening that is uh, interesting. Okay, uh, so if, if you're having something happen every thousand words, even if it's something completely stupid, like, you know their car gets broken into and they can react to that. As long as something happens that's of interest to the reader every thousand words, you're going to be good. Okay, that's my rule of thumb. I'm writing that story about the wizard with the melted face who seeks a necromancer to fix his face. This character came about as I was outlining a supporting cast. I love it. There you go. Write it. Um, what I do when I'm writing, I come up with an idea that involves me rewriting everything. Okay. I've been wondering this for a while and Google has failed me. What is a house? Is it a group of people who are related or are they not related or just under the same name? Okay, if we're talking about feudal systems, a house is the same as a clan or an extended family. Now, depending on the culture, 
the house will include only blood relatives or it could include the servants and slaves as well. So the house of David included uh, King David as well as his wives, as well as his concubines, all of his children and his slaves were all part of the house of David. Now, the slaves are probably not related to him, and yet they are considered part of this house, part of this familial arrangement, and have some binding to King David as well as rights compared to other people. Like, obviously, somebody who isn't uh, isn't the owner of that slave has no rights to tell the slave what to do or what, you know, to, to harm the slave or to punish the slave or to give the slave tasks or things like that, or in some cases to pay the slave. Um, so in in European history, the house simply meant, you know, the house of, I don't know, the house of Stuart would be the clan Stuart, be the Stuart clan. So in Scotland, they're just called clans. Now, if you're thinking of Fire Emblem Three Houses, this is this idea that you just have a, um, like a fraternity house. It's an artificial thing. It's just... Uh, it's a social grouping of people that's artificial in that case. But historically, house usually means an extended family. Have you ever written in a magical realism style like Gabriel Garcia Marquez? I don't think so. So I sometimes talk about magical realism and I realize in Spanish-speaking countries, magical realism is a genre that is very different from how we would think of it here in um, North America. So I think I've probably misspoken about it probably too many times because we just think of it differently. So the answer is probably no. Uh, you gave up on the Mission Impossible movies right before they had their renaissance. It has since become the rare franchise that gets better with each sequel instead of worse. Okay. In Morrowind, I believe the slaves and servants are part of the Dunmer houses. Yeah, I think that's right too. And you could join the house, um, which would basically become an artificial artificial family. It's a political group. Uh, number three is sort of a soft reboot and it's quite solid with a great villain. Number four is excellent. Number five and six are action spy thriller masterpieces. Interesting. <laughs> CS says that Mission Impossibles have been butt cheeks. <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll check them out. Maybe I won't. I don't watch a whole lot of movies these days because uh, I, don't, I don't have that much time to do it. That's just kind of how I am. All right. Um, so we're starting to run out of time. Make sure if you have any more questions, you put them in here. Talking about technique, I've, I've gone. There's lots of little tidbits on technique here in this seminar. The main things that I want you to focus on is lead with characters. Tell the story as much as possible through dialogue. Remember that characterization happens through dialogue and characters talking to each other and um, mostly reacting to events. So a plot event happens and characters talk to each other to get the reaction and that's where you get to really love the characters and know them. Um, this, If you're wanting the characters to have a conversation and you have no plot event next to it for them to have a conversation about, you need to think of something to happen. Even if it's something completely random like you know, Mike tripped and fell down the stairs and bonked his head. And now the characters have to react to that. That doesn't have any bearing on like a larger plot, but it's something for the characters to have a conversation with. If you want to reveal some characterization, um, I tend to avoid any scene where the event is not directly related to what I, to some part of the story I want to tell, because I think it gets, um, I think it gets a little bit, redundant you know it just adds things to the book that uh, are not necessary you always want the reader to feel like every scene is super important Let's see here do you think it's do you ever say screw historical accuracy and just make a setting bizarre yeah i'm doing that with a new book yeah i'm like it's totally gonna be space opera stuff um bizarro is its own thing bizarro is just no rules but bizarro fiction really uh, random things can happen. It's not just a, a crazy setting. It's also crazy things happen. Do you think it's better to give <clears throat> my characters different powers that only they have or give them all similar powers and maybe have a certain group of people have particular powers? I can't answer that. You'll have to decide it for yourself. Have you watched Death Note? I have. Um, so Death Note's great. 
But one of the things I notice about Death Note is that uh, it should have ended like a third of the two thirds of the way through, and I think they just kind of milked it for the end. And I think that's how the manga was: is that the writer was like, "I'm going to end it," and they're like, "It was so popular that they got persuaded not to end it and just continue it for another little pointless arc." Um, it's not completely pointless, but there's definitely a point where there's a resting point, and then they keep going. And that's the big flaw of it. It should have ended after L's death. That should have been the end of the series. Um, have you ever read chapter 17 of Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia? It's the best argument in favor of free speech that I've ever heard. I am. I have probably read it, but I don't think I could tell you any details about it. Just like I couldn't couldn't tell you details about common sense or like Federalist Papers. Because that's far enough in the past that it's... It's too separated from like my immediate knowledge to talk about. Um, there's lots, so there's lots of things about free speech. Like Jefferson is a very unconstrained kind of guy for the most part. There's lots of things about free speech that are really important with with Jefferson. Um, however, right now, as far as free speech, I have to think about how things act fractally. Um, which is to say smaller systems and bigger systems because ultimately total quote total free speech or total free expression is self-destructive you get what i call the bell ringer effect so the bell ringer effect is somebody comes up and rings a bell and nobody can talk because all you hear is a bell that's ringing now in order for us to have our freedom of speech which is the freedom to for me to communicate an idea and for you to receive it and for you to communicate an idea and for me to receive it that guy ringing the bell has to stop ringing the bell. So how do you get him to stop ringing a bell? It's like, oh, well, you've got to walk away from the bell ringer. Well, he follows you ringing the bell wherever you go. Well, you have to physically stop him from ringing the bell. Now you're limiting his free speech, right? So total free speech ultimately is subject to spoiler effects and other things. Uh, I want to mention this too. People have said, why don't you have a Discord server for all of us to talk about this stuff? The, I don't want to have a Discord server. You're free to, to try to convince me otherwise. I don't want to have a Discord server because it is a point of weakness for attack. Other YouTubers have had this happen. Bigger YouTubers than me, sometimes smaller YouTubers than me. They start a Discord server. Somebody that does not like them uses that Discord server to discredit them, to annoy their audience, to turn their audience against them. You're basically giving a free speech platform to people who hate you. Unless you are willing to moderate very very tightly what's on that discord server and i don't have the time to moderate a discord server i just don't um if i start a if i start a wow guild i'm gonna have a hard enough time getting people to moderate a discord or a, or a guild website for that i don't have time to moderate a free open discord server so if you're thinking of things of attack besides coming on and talking about how what an awful person i am uh, people who don't like me can come on there and spam it with child pornography, thus leading others to believe that I host a Discord server that is dedicated to child pornography. This has actually happened. There's people coming on sharing like furry cub porn or lollicon porn or other things which are generally objectionable and uh, kind of pushed off into corners of the internet that you allow to exist, but you know. You don't really want them you really don't really want to be confronted with like furry child porn or like lollicon porn you don't want that stuff uh, but that's that's what happens and it's happened to multiple people i've seen and i just don't want to deal with it um, whereas youtube it's much more locked down you can't even post i have it set up so you can't even post a link without me approving it so if, chances are if you posted a link on a comment and you didn't see your comment again it's because it has to go through a a, a spam process before i'll even see it to approve it um, because people will link to to outside websites that'll steal your credit card and all kinds of crap like that um so it has to be super locked down or it's a point of weakness and then if i have it really locked down and i'm banning people left and right then it's like i'm against free speech and uh what's the point of a discord if i'm just going to ban people it's like you get up with that kind of thing right now i know that there's people who get upset like i ban i banned pl plenty of people on the channel for bell ringing and other offenses as well like trying to link to outside sites that are other that would that would deceive other people so if you link to a site that would deceive i may ne may not be deceived by it but it could be a site that's not safe for other people to view i'm not going to let you post that because that ha has the potential to harm other people in my audience and therefore reflect badly on me you guys have to think about it from a from a businessman's perspective 
unlimited free speech can be uh, self-destructive. You got to have it be fractal. So it's free on the total level, meaning newspapers can publish whatever they want with each other, but the newspaper does not have to publish anybody who wants to to have it published, even cost them zero dollars to publish it. You don't have to allow every person in the world to ring a bell in your face. You know what I mean? How would you characterize the use of irony in dialogue, like ironic speech and subtext? Irony is is usually two things. First of all, ironic use of words means you're using a word for other than its literal intention. Meaning, um, if I say, oh yeah, you know, Futurama, actually they specifically talk about irony in this. Uh, I will trade you ears for your hand. Okay, I'll trade that. You could chop my hand off. It's like, okay, no, I meant your hand in marriage. So it's an irony. We're using it other than its literal intention. But it's been expanded over time to mean dramatic irony, which is just an outcome that's the opposite of what's expected. That's not really irony. To me, it's more like an outcome that is... um, basically the opposite of what's intended. That would be dramatic irony. So like you intend to save somebody and instead you save Hitler who blows up the world or something, right? That would be kind of an ironic thing. Not coincidental. Coincidental would be, oh, we both ran into each other at the store. How ironic. No, that's not ironic. It's just coincidental. I started off my debut novel with a one-page prologue written in rhyme and poetry to set the scene of the novel. What do you think of that? I've done it. Um, I did it in Needle Ash. Losing track of all my books. Yeah, I started off with a with a free verse poem. So I did it. As long as it's interesting, I think it's great. You can do that. Have you seen One Punch Man? Yes. I think it's very funny. Dragon Ball Z had the same problem as Death Note. It was supposed to be done when, uh, was it Frieza? Or Cell died, I think. But they just kept throwing money at, at Toriyama until it was cringe. See, I haven't, I haven't seen Dragon Ball Z in a long time. You, yes, One Punch Man... Uh, is there a way to... I've done a video on One Punch Man. Is there any way to get in contact with you if I need help with something specific? Stu, S-T-U, at dvspress.com. Uh, best way to come up with names for characters. I don't have a system other than the whatever culture they're in. That's I just use those, whatever's closest to real-life culture. So for the next uh, Eternal Dream novel, it's kind of... The people are Frankish, so I'm using Frankish-sounding names. And that's how I'm going for, with it. For Needle Ash, they're kind of northern Italian names with some things mixed in. Um, for Water of Awakening, they're Norse and Germanic names or takes on those, variations of those. Jefferson's argument was about free speech in terms of lack of government censorship. He was talking about censorship. So, you know, this is another thing. is defining free speech according to, quote, the state when you have corporations which are created by the state is, is a little bit outdated. you got to think a little bit broader. Um, there'd be no such thing as Google without the state to create the concept known as a corporation and to empower that corporation to act as a person to then say it's okay for Google to censor people but not the government is nonsense. The point is, is freedom of speech a freedom? Is it a thing? Or are you defining everything in terms of a negative, meaning you don't have any freedom to speak, you only have, there should only not be government restricting it. Or this thing which we define as the state, because the Google Google can sue you using the power of the state, right? Google, you can sue Google using the power of the state. So the state's involved in any interaction that you're doing there. The idea that the state is this separate thing, it probably was when Jefferson was around, but it ain't anymore. Not with the, the, the way corporate law works today. Corporations are a state or a state created entity and therefore are intrinsically bound up in state action always. They're either they're either acting with the permission of the state or like the explicit approval of the state. Like who needs the state to censor people if the only way that you could speak you're censored on? Like if you if you have a telephone line and the telephone company says you can't say certain words over the telephone. You're like, well, that's not censorship because the government isn't doing it. Well, the government is the one creating that telephone company's monopoly over you. It's the government's um, corporate law that allowed the corporation to exist uh, as it is anyway, rather than having it be owned by separate individuals. If 
the comment has a link. YouTube will shadow ban. It still shows you, uh, but not the video. Interesting. Are you familiar with The Rocketeer? I see, I've read the movie, or I've watched the movie. And I liked the movie, but I haven't seen it probably in 25 years. What do you think uh, that it's a bad idea to write a horror story without particular strong characters? Like The War of the Worlds. I don't think it's a bad idea. I've seen it done multiple times. As long as the, the villain is very scary, we don't need a strong protagonist the, if the focus is on the, the horror of the villain. You could kill off lots of people like in a zombie movie and it's fine. Have you seen My Hero Academia? I have not, but everybody's saying uh, stuff about it, so maybe I should watch it, at least watch one of them. How can you tell if part of a story needs more conflict? If it's boring, if you reread it and it's boring, I guess. Maybe you need more tension between characters. Maybe you need a more pressing need for the characters to act. Um, if you feel like there's no forward momentum, then you need to up the ante. There needs to be a reason for the characters to act. You, you may have to create stronger, stronger motivations for them. All right, we hit eight o'clock, so it's about time for us to, to tie it up. Nathan Rosario says, unlimited free speech only works with a moral population. Now here's the thing, unlimited free speech works fractally. So I can have unlimited free speech like with my wife, where we're like two individuals that are respecting each other's ability to speak. But as you broaden it and get bigger and bigger, it's impossible for competing voices to be able to sound uh, and be heard and talk to each other without bell ringing effects and spoiler effects um, interfering with people's ability to communicate. So at that point, like on fractal levels, you could create barriers for people to speak to each other, but that's only to allow other people to speak to each other. Um, whether that's a barrier called like, you know, uh, different social media platforms or it's a barrier like my front door. You can't talk to me through my front door. Uh, certain limitations in the world need to exist. What are your thoughts on August uh, Derleth? Uh, no thoughts. I don't think I know who that is. Are we just going for manly A and B story? Okay, for this one, <laughs> mainly A and B story. Yeah, for this one, I'd go all A story as little B story as possible. Mine's gonna have an A and a B story, but not really a C story. There's no supporting character story. It's all the main character and the B story is gonna be his love interest. So I'm going A, B story on this. Uh, any more than that and it would start getting to be like a 60,000 word novel, which is too long for me to write right now. What are your thoughts on the narrative of Arthur Gordon Prim of Nantucket? I have no memory of this. People shout out like random stories. I haven't read everything that exists. Who wrote this? Oh, this is Edgar Allan Poe. I, like I had to Google it. I don't think I read it. I don't think I ever read it, guys. In fact, I'm sure I didn't, unfortunately. Um, Mostly have read like Poe's other things. His like stories, his poems. I don't think I ever read this novel. What's it, what's it about? I'll have to read it at some point. Yeah, I don't think I ever read it. <laughs> Sorry, all right, so we're about out of time. And uh, I appreciate you guys joining me. Of course, um, you can read my books if you want and see what I'm gonna do. So I don't have a good title for this uh, this book that I'm writing right now, but you guys can give me one if you wanna give me one down in the comment section or whatever. Uh, maybe I'll take it into account. I'm, tr I'm trying to think of something that's gonna be like really catchy. I'll probably come up with something really good and you guys will, you guys will be there like, oh, well, like this hits the market, you know. Um, hits the market really well, so. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, feel free to email me any comments at stu, stu at dbspress.com. Um, one last question I see, if I wanted to write a Star Wars fan fiction story, would that be a waste of time? As a technical exercise, no. As a profit-seeking enterprise, yes. Because you cannot sell it. You can only post it like on fan fiction websites. So 
if you want to write something that you can sell and build readership from, chances are you want to write something original. But I don't know because I don't write Star Wars fan fiction and I don't know if you can build a list on fan fiction websites. I've never really done it. So keep, keep in mind my advice is centered on what I do. So to close to think about leading with characters. Yes, try to tell the story as much as possible with dialogue. Tie everything into the main plot. Yeah, if you uh, if it's if you're if you're hitting the dialogue and the dialogue's really good, people are going to like it. Um, people don't skip dialogue. They always read the dialogue. So the dialogue is the best and lead with the characters, not the setting. And that's probably going to be it for tonight. I really really do appreciate you joining me. I appreciate the super chat. Um and I hope you guys will have good luck. Next week, we will talk about finishing your manuscript, writing your ending, making it very good, and uh, what you do when you're done. Because the first thing you should do when you finish is like eat a cake or something because um, finishing a project is a big deal. And uh, that's what we'll do. So thanks so much, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you.